If you're watching this video, chances are you're streaming data from one of YouTube's servers across the ocean via the internet. But have you ever wondered how that data gets to you? Well, if you have, you've probably imagined it moving wirelessly through the air, like Wi-Fi or 5G. But the real backbone of global connectivity is a network of subsea fiber optic cables. To connect continents, fiber optic cables have been laid across ocean floors over decades by specialized ships called cable laying vessels. Before laying a cable, engineers analyze geological data as well as seabed maps to determine the best route. Now, after they've done this, research vessels are sent out to conduct a physical seabed survey. They do this by using sonar and other instruments to ensure the chosen route is suitable. Then, when the route is confirmed, the next step is manufacturing the required length of the fiber optic cable and loading it onto the ship. So modern cable laying ships are equipped with massive turntables that store and deploy the cables. After the ship is fully loaded and ready, it goes to a predetermined landing point where one end of the cable is brought from the ship to the shore using a smaller work boat. Now, once secured on land, the ship starts moving slowly out to sea. This first part of the cable is laid in shallow water, which can make it easy to damage. For example, fishing trawls, they can snag and drag the cable, and ship anchors can accidentally hook onto the cable and snap it. So to mitigate these risks, the cable is buried underneath the seabed using a specialized machine known as the plow. Now this steel plow, which looks like a robot, can weigh between 20 and 30 tons. That's almost the weight of a fully grown humpback whale. Now after it's been lowered from the ship to the seabed, the ship begins towing it with a steel rope, similar to how a tractor pulls a plow on land. As the plow moves, the support structures, called skids, are adjusted to lower the plow further into the seabed to create a trench. A groove underneath the plow known as the cable guide then carefully places the cable inside the trench. Hydraulic arms control the skid's position, allowing them to adjust how deep the cable's buried. Now the plow's connected to the ship via an umbilical wire that transmits power and control signals. Since an extensive network of fiber optic connections already exists on the seabed, newly laid cables often need to cross over the old ones. Now at these points, the plow must stop 500 meters before reaching the pre-existing cable to prevent damage. Then, the ship slowly moves backward, rewinding the extra length. Once the ship reaches the plow's position, it's lifted 10 to 20 meters above the seabed. The ship then resumes forward motion, continuing to lay the cable on the seabed without burying the old one. Now, during this phase, the plow moves forward in a lifted position, suspended in the water without touching the seabed. When the ship reaches a point 500 meters beyond the crossing cable, the plow is lowered back onto the seabed to be able to resume the burial process. This means there's a one kilometer section of cable left unburied. Now I know what you're thinking. Doesn't it mean the cable could be damaged by ship anchors? Well, this is where the remotely operated vehicle or ROV comes in. The ROV is controlled from the ship and unlike the plow, doesn't require towing. It's equipped with multiple thrusters to allow it to maneuver freely in the water. It's also fitted with a video feed and various sensors, enabling it to identify the exact position of the crossing cable. Once the location is confirmed, the ROV begins the burial process. It creates a trench using high pressure water jets, places the cable inside, and performs a post burial inspection to ensure proper placement and coverage. Now, in addition to handling cable crossings, the ROV is also deployed in areas where seabed conditions prevent the plow from operating effectively. In such cases, the ROV takes over, ensuring the cable is protected even in challenging environments. Once the cable reaches depths of over 1,500 meters, the risk of external damage is minimal, so the cable is simply laid on the seabed. Since most of a submarine cable's route crosses deep ocean basins, these depths make up the majority of its path. For those deep water sections, the cable is also different. Unlike the heavily armored cable used in shallow water, deep sea cables have lighter protection, making them thinner, about the size of a garden hose. As the cable ship reaches shallow waters again, the plow is redeployed to create a trench and bury the cable, protecting it from fishing activities and anchoring. Now, when the ship reaches the landing point, the other end of the cable is brought ashore using a smaller workboat. Once secured on land, 
the installation stage of the undersea fiber optic cable is complete. This newly laid cable is designed to last 25 years, during which it's expected to perform effectively and safely under normal conditions. Now in reality, they break, often. <laughs> On average, two to four cables are damaged somewhere in the world every week. Now you might think, but why haven't I heard about internet outages on the news every week? Well, that's because ships are constantly repairing these breaks in the cables, while network operators distribute traffic across other cables to ensure there's no disruption during repairs. So, when a cable fault is detected, the repair process begins by determining the general area of the fault. After the ship reaches that area, the repair ship deliberately cuts the cable at the location several meters before the damaged segment so that the intact portion of the cable can be carefully retrieved aboard the vessel. Now on board, technicians verify that the retrieved cable section is still functional. After that, that end is sealed, securely tied to a buoy, and lowered back into the water. Meanwhile, the ship moves to the other side of the fault to repeat the same process of cutting and retrieving the second end. This segment is also tested to ensure its functionality. When both ends have been confirmed to carry a good signal, a new spare length of cable is brought on board and spliced to the old cable. Splicing involves joining the old cable to the new section, a procedure that can take several days to complete. During the entire splicing operation, it's crucial that the ship remains precisely positioned. To achieve this, the ship uses a dynamic positioning system, or DP. Now this computer control system continuously analyzes GPS data, weather conditions, and other environmental factors to send real-time signals to the ship's thrusters, keeping the ship in position, even in rough seas. This constant station keeping is essential because any drift could stress the cable and cause further damage. After the splicing is finished, the ship drops that end of the cable and returns to the first end of the cable that was left tied to a buoy to join it to the other end of the new spare cable. Once a continuous and functional link is established, comprehensive tests are performed to confirm the repaired cable is working correctly. With successful testing, the cable is then carefully lowered back to the seabed. Now in some cases, an ROV may be deployed to bury the cable protecting it from future damage by anchoring or fishing activities. If these ships couldn't lay or repair undersea cables, the internet we know simply wouldn't exist. Sure, we could use satellites for intercontinental data transmission, but it would be unbearably slow and it would struggle to meet the world's growing demands. In fact, the Marea cable, which is currently the fastest connection between the United States and Europe, has a higher capacity than the entire satellite network combined. That's why for the foreseeable future, we depend on these ships and cables. Do you have maritime experience and technical knowledge to share with our audience? Join our team of scriptwriters and deliver accurate, engaging content to maritime professionals and enthusiasts. Shoot us a message at the email in the description. We'd love to have you on board. For more fascinating maritime insights, make sure you check out this video. And thank you for your support through Patreon. See you next time.